Hey guys, you are going to love my latest interview for my podcast channel with a friend of mine called Ray Panthaki. Ray is a BAFTA award winning actor, director based in London, and we spoke about his craft as an actor, his approach to parts in TV and movies, the massive blockbuster Netflix series he's just filmed called Away, coming out very soon. He is a great guy and a brilliant guy. You're going to love this interview. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a comment. Thank you. So let me ask you, how did you get into acting? Because it's a notoriously difficult career to sustain yourself, yeah. as you know. So how did you get into acting and why have you kind of stayed in it? <laughs> the realization of why I got into acting is something that's come more recently. Mm. Uh, yeah, as I've got to understand myself a lot more as I've got older and I've worked on myself as a person. And I started to realize that because I wasn't ever really quite sure why it was. And mm. as I've sort of worked, you know, worked through it, I've realized it actually came from a place of wanting to be desired. And I think I initially went into it because I didn't feel desired as a child or I didn't feel, uh, I felt different, I guess. And that might be to do with a number of reasons, uh, most notably my skin color, perhaps. But feeling different at school and feeling different to the people around me in school. And there was a boy in my class who was actually this blonde-haired, blue-eyed boy who was, who, who was an actor. And uh, he got lots of attention at school um, through the acting that he was doing. And, uh, and I remember just being very jealous of it and thinking to myself, I can do that. And I can get that attention. And it came from that place, really. And uh, and I remember going home one day and saying to my parents, I was extremely shy as a child, but I remember saying to my parents that I wanted to get into acting. And they said, it's fine, we can try and do that for you, but you're really shy and you don't speak to anyone. How are you going to do acting? And I said, I just really want to do it. And so they uh, phoned around local drama schools and one of them said, tell Ray to come down this weekend and he can watch. And so I did. And I remember being extremely uncomfortable uh, sitting in this, in this class full of extrovert kids and feeling really out of my depth and shy and awkward. But there was something about <laughs> this particular drama school sort of, um, uh, you, would, you would learn singing, acting and dancing. And uh, the singing and dancing didn't interest me, but there was something about the acting just mesmerized me and drew me in. And I guess that I, it, was, it drew me in enough to, to, to stick it out and go through the uncomfort. And, uh, and yeah, and it, and it became, it's just amazing how it became my calling in a weird way, because it didn't come from a place of knowing it was my calling. It came from a place of, <laughs> Uh, probably from uh, from some wound or trauma, and it ended up being my calling. So you interpreted that, you used that as fuel to proceed into acting. Uh, you may be connecting the dots, the dots better now, reflectively, but that mm. moment on stage and moments like that, when you saw the kid that was uh, on stage and you thought, I can do that too, you have interpreted that, or you did, and used it as a fuel to step into that yourself. I think a lot of people want to know why people got into what they got into, especially when they've been in it long-term and successful, and wonder if someone opened a door for you, if it was who you know, not what you know, especially in the sort of showbiz world. But your beginnings were just flat out the same as any kid in a school play in my experience today. Yes, yes. There was, I mean, I don't remember prior to being the age of 10 or 11 when I first wanted to do it, I don't remember having a particular desire. I was a shy kid, so there was no, I, was, I wasn't the kid that was naturally performing for, for parents and their friends at home. So I, I know that for sure. But I do have this strong memory of wanting to do what this, this boy did in my, in my class because I guess he got attention from girls. <laughs> and, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that ended up being my, my fuel in, in some sense because he was getting attention for what he did. He was on McDonald's commercials and he was on television. And 
that there was a he he was treated in a different way, and so maybe it came from a place of wanting to be tr- wanting to be treated differently. Um, but yeah, that's that's it. I, if if I had to round it up into one word, I would say it was to be desired. Yeah, you know, Tony Robbins and others speak about the six basic human needs. One of them is significance, and I think what you're describing may well be the awakening that some of us have that a primary human need we have in life is one of our top of those six is significance. You know, there are others like certainty and variety and, uh, and growth and contribution, love and connection, but that sense of significance that woke up in you, the possibility of that totally makes sense to me when I think about other people that have moved into some significant career, people in politics and business and showbiz, often I think the fuel was significance though the experience that they had you wouldn't use that word for it and about it i'm just framing it that way wondering if that what fueled you and if so does that continue to be your major fuel now or not no at least i don't think so mm. but my my uh my drive is a lot different now i guess my drive now is to it's less about significance significance for myself and it's more about um, putting good art into the world that can change the world. Mm. And, uh, you know, I know a lot of people say that, but it really did, there has become a a turning point for me where the realization of that and what made me happy and what makes me happy and what continues to fuel me is no longer I guess there is an element about it for me, but the bigger element is for others. So has that shifted the choices you make as to why you will or won't do certain things? Because if you are doing things based on that need for significance, it may mean you make certain choices about what to do different to if you're choosing something from a sense of service to the rest of us. A lot of people in the world that are driven by that significance make choices just to keep that alive and never switch from that to a wider sense of serving the rest of us. So have your choices of the projects you're involved in changed because of that shift in you of what drives you? Yes, they have. But I think that there's a balance because there's some projects that you know may not be of service to other people, but you know, they may offer you significant that gives you a step up to be able to be a stronger service to other people. So I think there's, um, there's, there's a, a, a balance to be had. Sometimes you have to be smart about making decisions and choices that, you know, further down the line will give you more of a voice or give you more of a platform to be able to make choices, other choices, which, can help serve other people. So there's always a, I always look at things for a number of reasons and anything that gets offered to me, I sort of balance it up for different reasons. And sometimes that there's a less of a um, desire to do something, but then there's, it's a smart decision to do it because of what it could lead to. Yeah. yeah. Cause I know you now, do different things besides acting. You wear a director's hat and a production hat. Of the span of things that you now do as you're evolving, um, is acting still your first love or do you, are you more drawn to directing behind the camera these Mm. days? Where do you think that's heading for you? Uh, Acting is such a big life. It's a question that people often ask me and I have, I get, so, so my, my, journey into storytelling writing directing and producing that came from a place of not being fulfilled enough as an actor or not getting the opportunities within the industry as an actor Mm -hmm. so i decided that i'm going to go and create those opportunities for myself so people can 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 see that i can be a leading actor if they're not going to give me the opportunity to be a leading actor and so rather than sort of uh, campaign against it I went I'm not going to waste that time I'm just going to put my head down and work and show and create and so that's what I did and so again I was it came from a place of um, needing something else but I just decided to jump in and do it myself and that and what I learned from that was 
actually I am a storyteller. And it's amazing how, again, I was pushed into it somehow. And from that, I realized storytelling is my passion. Um, and I realized I could be in control of the whole story suddenly, rather than be just a piece of the jigsaw of the story as an actor. Right. And also it enabled me to focus on something. As, a, as an actor, everything is so up in the air. There's no stability. Mm. You're often waiting months for jobs. Mm. And so what in, it enabled me to do was to almost focus on something which, which I called my nine to five. So if I wasn't acting, instead of sitting at home being depressed, waiting for the phone to ring, mm. I'd be focusing on something like a nine to five in front of my laptop writing, teaching myself how to produce uh, and studying. And so what's uh, to answer your question, acting has been such a big part of my life. Yes, it probably still is my number one love, but also I think it's on par with directing. If I was to take the four of them, writing, acting, producing, and directing, I think acting and directing are the two that sort of are on an equal footing at the moment. They fulfill me in different ways. I still feel as an actor, I've got performances in me that need to come out, that I need to give and I need to share with the world. And I don't think I've been fully pushed as an actor just yet. But as a director, when I stepped onto set as a director for the first time in my life, I'd never directed anything before. Obviously it was the first time. Um, I went into it with very limited, uh, uh, tools I had we had very li little money very little time but I had a story that was so personal to me that I wanted to share with the world that I knew I didn't want anyone else to tell this story so I stepped on set as a director and it was literally like I, it was a calling I knew in that moment the second I stepped on set because suddenly I didn't have to care about the way I looked. I didn't have to care about remembering my lines. I didn't have to care about all, about all these things that used to be baggage for me as an actor. But I, I stepped on as a director and I realized I'm in control here, complete control and I can do this. And it was just, it was, it was weird. I've had these moments a few times in my life where I've gone and it happened to me as an actor on stage when I was younger as when I was a teenager and that made me realize I need to do this as a career and it happened to me uh, my first time on set as a director and I had this moment this epiphany which was this is a calling of yours as well so acting and directing for a very long-winded answer to your question That's acting interesting. And directing are the two things the stories that you are telling and are drawn to is there something common about them what are the stories you want to tell what are the stories that matter the most to you is there a, a thread in those through your life and things you're drawn to? Yeah, I guess there is. Again, as I work on myself more as a person, I start to realize that every character I've ever written is a little bit of me somewhere along the line. Wow. And, uh, and it took me years to, to, to have that revelation. Mm. I guess there are common threads um, of stories I do want to tell. It's always tends to be people on the fringes of society. There's certain themes that seem to keep coming up in my work. I think loneliness is something that is, is, is sitting with me at the moment and a lot of the characters mm. I'm writing, especially during this pandemic, interestingly mm. enough. But um, that's, that's the theme. It's always been about the underdog, I guess. Right. And, and, the, and the softer people of society, the meeker and quieter people. And I, think, I still feel like they seem to be the characters that naturally come out of me. And so I think there's a calling for me to want to be able to tell those stories. Do you think that's rooted in your sense of exclusion as a kid that you talked about earlier? That quite sense possibly. of wanting to champion those people? Yeah, I've not, I've not gone that deep into it, but quite possibly, yes, quite possibly. But also, if it could be that it could also be that i have a heart for the, the softer people in society the meek people in society and mm. and uh the ones that don't have a voice or struggle struggle to have a voice i guess mm. and i my work seems to 
try and give those people a voice. Do you have you struggled? Do you still struggle? People would want to know, I think, at your age and stage of career with um, what would you call a stage fright in the, you know, if you're doing a live a play or imposter syndrome, we might say, if you get a part and think, geez, um, I said I'd do it, but I don't know if I can pull it off or not. Because a lot of people struggle with that and interpret it as a reason not to go ahead. Yes, absolutely. Every single time. That never goes really? away. The idea of oh. imposter syndrome. It certainly doesn't for me. It's always there. Stage fright is always there for me. Mm. Not so much on, uh, on camera, actually, because I think there's a, there's a comfort of knowing you can do it again and again. Right. But certainly in theatre, it's something that never goes, the nerves never go away. I could be doing a play for a hundred nights and my, my uh, fear will be the same on night one as it is on night 100. It, it, it's the same. But again, I don't ever want to lose that in some respects. I don't want to become complacent. And that fear, I guess, I like stepping into fear. So that kind of pushes me to get out on that stage. I mean, it's a sickly, horrible feeling before you step on. It really is. And I'm always pacing up and down backstage and people are trying to talk to me and I cannot talk to them because I'm just focusing on these nerves. And then of course, when you step out and the five minutes of being on stage or within getting your first laugh, if it's a comedy, you'll, you're suddenly, you relax and then you just enjoy the process and then you can never get me off there. <laughs> and then I don't, at that point, I don't want to come off. But uh, uh, yeah. I, I, the nerves always hit me and imposter syndrome will be something that I guess I, you have to get used to. Certainly for me, um, there's, I feel it pretty much, pretty much on every single job. You know, I feel very blessed to, to do something to do, first of all, to do what I love doing mm. in my job and, uh, to get to travel and do all these amazing things. One of the things I think creative people struggle with, um, is what I call babysitting their creativity. In other words, after you've done it and published it or posted it or, or put out the piece of work you've done, then you sit around almost in the shadows hoping people will like it. And then you get upset or touchy or defensive if someone says something critical because you've stayed over attached to the product. I think, you know, I've written several books and I wish I could go back and rewrite them all a year later because I now think something different to what I thought a year ago, but it's too late. And once, of course, sure. with, on film, it's over. You can't go back and redo it. So I suppose what I mean is, do you get attached to projects? Are you, do you read what the critics say? Does that bother you? Or do you just move on, think that's it, I can't change it, and sort of step away from it? I find it difficult. I especially if it's something that I've created. Um, yeah. You keep wanting to perfect it, keep wanting yeah. to make it better before it goes out to the world. You wanted to make it the best you can make it. And then I had to learn to realize that nothing can be perfect. And I read a quote from, I think it might have been George Lucas. I could be wrong. Yeah. But he said something along the lines of, you never finish a film. You, you learn to abandon it. Wow. And that was, um, that was real. Coming from someone like that, it was an eye opener for me because you do never finish a movie. You can keep perfecting something or trying to make it better, but there has to be a point where you abandon it and let it out to the world. And uh, I always struggle with that. I guess it's, again, it's that fear of being rejected, I suppose. But my art, I'm, especially a few years back, I used to always keep it close to my chest and be scared to put it out to the world mm -hmm. or scared to uh, push for the final furlong of a, of, a, of, a, of a script that I'd written, I guess through fear of, of, of rejection of my art. But actually, when I started to realize, just let it out. And then people started to appreciate it. And, and, I was, and then I sat back and said, why did I hold on to this for so long? I'm always 
critical, doubtful, self-doubt. But then I realized it's always, or mostly in my own head, head once the project goes out to the world because people generally do appreciate it. Do you think you'd feel more attached to it as a director or as an actor? And even worse, if you are both in a project, because some a lot of actors act and direct at the same time. So it really is your baby in every way then. Yes. I think as a director, I'd be, I mean, I've not directed myself yet as an actor. Right. So, and I don't think that's something I'll be rushing to do uh, quite soon. But yeah. I... I certainly as a director because I write and direct so it's much more personal to me right and so yes and there's always going to be facets within stories that are personal to me so yeah I, I am precious about that and I am fearful about sharing that stuff with the world but also at the same time I think it makes the best art yes yeah I get that what are some of the most difficult emotions to act do you feel like if you get a script and it involves a certain scene do you think oh crikey that is gonna be tough i'm gonna have to really get in the zone to express that kind of anger or pain or rage um, or hate if the scene requires you and your character to to inhabit a certain emotion are there some that you dread coming up in a opportunity for you that you find particularly difficult and how do you approach it if it's not an emotion that's native to you that is not common to your experience as a human but you have to find that energy to act it well i mean every actor uses different different techniques to be able to get to a place um i feel that everyone's had experiences of similar emotions so they may not have lost uh, a, a a parent or someone close to them but they may be able to recall an emotion of having lost something as a child maybe a toy or something but you are able to recall an emotion um, and work from that basis of that feeling of loss and what it felt like so i think there's always something that you can pull from other times you would have to study and try and find other people's experiences that have been through certain things and try and learn and recreate as much their experience as possible from what you've learned from them. Um, but I think in terms of we can all connect a emotion pretty much to every emotion that you have to be able to deliver within a film, Actually, even if it's a loose connection, but we can build from that. So I, nothing sort of scares me really as, especially now in my career where I'm feeling very confident as an actor and what I'm able to do and achieve. It's actually the more challenging stuff I get, the more it excites me. And the, the, the more roles I get where the more research needs to be done, that excites me. Taking a character um, that I perhaps haven't had the same experiences of. Yeah. And I have to build this character through research is something that um, challenges me and something that I'm more interested in doing now. Because I know you weren't a violent character in Gangs of London, but it was a violent show. What do you feel about movies, programs of which that's a major theme and around the energy? I wonder how actors stay in that zone if it's a prolonged project they're involved in, if their character is an aggressive, violent person, and so on, so on, or their character's a racist, or their character is a drug addict or something, or a criminal, and it's not common to your experience. In other words, your life experience has nothing to hand you in a certain role. Where do you guys find it from? I mean, we, we can talk about these transformative roles that people have done, and I guess it comes from studying. It comes from studying and talking to people there are a lot of actors that are method actors that like to sort of live it as much as they can a, a, a certain role and will be in character leading up to the production of a film and obviously there's always lines that need to be drawn and you know lines that can't be crossed but certainly they will get into the mindset of a certain character and live that character before they get in set so they feel very prepared 
Is method acting something that you taught at acting school as an option, as a style? And if it is, why would some people choose that as opposed to another style of acting? Like is method acting, um, is that good acting? Is that something? Well, I think there's so many different um, techniques to acting. And I think what you have to find the style that suits you best. Okay. I mean, I've dabbled with all different types of styles of acting. Method was something that interested me years ago, and I did certain things that were method based. And then there are others that, I mean, but I also, at the same time, I can go on set having prepared in the method technique for a role, but I can switch it off at the end of the day. Okay, yeah. Uh, some actors can't, and some actors consume themselves with the, with the character and will still almost be in character months after the film has wrapped production and almost need some sort of therapy to sort of come out of the character that they've got so involved with. Um, I fortunately have, have not ever had that issue and I'm able to sort of switch off at the end of the day and step away from it and then get myself back into the zone for the next day. Who have been some of your acting role models, Ray? Like who would be your favorite actors, either past or present? I think um, Marlon Brando's a favorite. Why? A lot of people say that about Brando. Was he a method actor? He was, and for me, I felt that he changed the game in screen acting. So he sort of came at a time where he brought, he was part of this new wave of actor that was bringing a, a, a a new shift in the acting style of screen acting where it was all steeped in naturalism and truth and in those days the acting was sort of heightened and slightly overacting and uh, Brando just came in and brought this new energy he was part of that new wave of actor bringing this new naturalism and truth to, to screen acting and so he changed the game I feel and so he is someone that I'm constantly learning from and mesmerized by because i heard really? michael i heard michael kane once say about acting that he felt the best actors behaved they didn't act is that what you mean by brando yes i just feel that he was he was unpredictable and present and he's so in it i mean they say that acting is the best acting is when you're listening. So you're so in the moment, you're so present that you're not worried about where you are, what you're doing, what you look like, or what your next line is. But you are so present that you are absolutely 100% focused on the person that you're acting with. And so they can say anything, but you're so present that you're responding to what they say um, while still keeping the integrity of your character. Brando, he was completely present and immersed on screen. There's, there's a wonderful scene, I think it's uh, on the waterfront, perhaps. There's a scene, you can YouTube it, where he, uh, it's, it's the, if you just type in the Brando glove scene. Right. And he's, he's in the moment acting and, uh, talking it's him and another character talking and he drops a glove completely it happened in the moment and uh he keeps continuing he picks his glove up and the way he plays with this glove during the scene which obviously had to be completely spontaneous and he just and what he does with this glove and uses it within the scene is amazing and it's sort of just this filmmaking magic acting magic which was just he was just so present in the zone that he uh it's worth watching i think for someone again that is, and i heard michael kane i think referred to that as use he talked about using the difficulty so he was on a movie he said and the scene involved him barging into the kitchen and having a violent exchange with this woman in the kitchen so he the, the director says action he pushes the door, but the door didn't open properly. 
it jammed a little bit. So Michael Caine stopped and you know cursed a few words about the, the door. And then the director said to him, look, Michael, if the door jammed, use that difficulty and act off it, the dropped glove, I suppose. Use the difficulty and let it be part of the scene rather than say, the door didn't work perfectly, so I can't act at the moment. I think that's what you're saying about using the difficulty to enhance your performance rather than see it as a reason why I can't perform, which honestly is a probably a right life principle. Hey, we're all using yeah. the difficulty right now in the pandemic. Yeah, absolutely. And it's real life. You know, nothing goes yes. smoothly. <laughs> Things go wrong. Things happen in the moment and you have to deal with them. And so that to me, so he brought a real truth and naturalism to, to screen acting. So he definitely is an inspiration and also who he was as a person. I love the fact that he was constantly prepared to put his career on the line for things that he believed in and ad advocate for. Um, so yes, Marlon Brando, there's other people, Meryl Streep, who is just mm. consistently brilliant in everything. Yep. Uh, Mark Rylance is a huge inspiration of mine. Yep. And, I love him. You know, yes, and, and his uh, integrity as an actor. I love the fact that, you know, as rumour has it, that Mark Rylance will go through a, a movie script before he starts and he'll... Uh, He'll just be crossing out lines and people will be like, what are you doing? He's like, I can do that with a look. I can do that with a look. I don't wow. need to say that. I can do that with a look. And so I just find, you know. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I just found, find him interesting as a person, as, a, as, a, as an actor. I find his choices fascinating. I love the fact that he turned down movies for years and years and not just small movies you know Spielberg was chasing him for years as an actor wow. and he was just like no I want to be in the theatre that's where my wow. heart is and so I respect him as an actor and he's an amazing man as well I was fortunate to meet him he's an amazing man and mm. uh, uh, who else Shia LaBeouf which is yes. always a controversial one and um, people often say to me, really, Shia LaBeouf, he's one of your favorite actors? And I say, yeah, because I think there's a, there's a, there's a truth to everything he does. Mm. I find him completely mesmerizing. And as an actor, I watch him and I think there's such truth in everything he does. Mm. Um, and uh, I think it comes from a place of pain. So I think there is uh, something in his eyes that can't be recreated. And I find him really present and exciting and I find his choices exciting so yeah sort of as a, uh, a younger actor I'd say Shia LaBeouf. Tom Hanks? Great actor, great actor. There's so many great actors, this thing this could go on forever. I um, know. There's so many greats and the good thing is I feel like the true greats you know that, that we all know their names and and uh, and I like to believe Maybe it's not always true, but I like to believe that, that the good always rise to the top in the end. Do you watch yourself? Interesting question. When you've done a project, would you go back and watch it? I do watch think? myself. Oh, no. You do? I do watch myself, but only because there's a 5% chance it's going to make me feel good. So, <laughs> so it's weird. It, there's 95% of the time I'll watch something I'm in and I'll be disappointed, frustrated, annoyed with myself. Thought right. I could have done better. Thought I could have done this. Thought I could have done that. And so actually the odds are always stacked against me by watching myself. I should be one of those actors that doesn't watch himself, but I do it for that 5% chance of going, that's made me feel good today because that was a good bit of acting or I was happy with that. Um, so yeah, I shouldn't watch myself, but I do just to get the chance of myself feeling good. Um, but yeah, I'm very critical of what I do. I don't think that will ever go away now. I've come to make my peace with that. I see very different to what other people are seeing. And, uh, and I'm a perfectionist, I guess. And I just want to be the best I can. And I'll always be disappointed and feel I can do better but it's all things that I'm noticing and probably no one else is. Did winning the BAFTA change your career? And if so, how? Yeah, so I got named as one of these BAFTA breakthrough Brit Brits mm. back in 2014. And um, it was in the early days of this uh, scheme or award. 
and uh, recognition, I should say. Mm. And um, that came in a, a really beautiful time in my career because I, it was at a time where I felt I kept hitting the glass ceiling. Mm. I was incredibly frustrated, um, knew I had um, so much to give as an actor and artist, but kept feeling that I was hitting mm. at a certain point I couldn't go beyond. Right. And then out of the blue, I get a phone call one day from BAFTA to say, um, you know, we've decided to name you as one of our, I think it was, it was 15, 14 or 15 of us at the time, uh, one of our BAFTA breakthrough Brits. And that was, it's a really prestigious thing. And mm -hmm. um, I literally was floored because, you know, you got the, suddenly got the biggest film establishment in mm -hmm. the country and one of the biggest in the world suddenly just going, we're aware of all your work, everything you've right. been doing, we're aware of it and we want to help support that. And it was, it was one of the really real special times in my career. I remember going home to my dad. Actually, they told me, they said, you can't tell anyone this news. You really can't tell anyone because we're going to announce these in six months. But I remember going back to visit my dad and I couldn't really contain myself because I had to tell him he's been such a supporter of me and my career. Mm. And I remember saying, and he's been there through all the trials and tribulations. and. Uh, I remember going back and saying, Dad, I've got some news. I've got a phone call. And they're going to name me as a BAFTA Breakthrough Brit. And I remember him breaking down into tears. And it was wow. a really special moment because it was just, uh, you know, he's been there through everything. You know, being an actor is not an easy life. It's constantly up and down. Right. And uh, I've, I've had my fair share of those ups and downs. And I've mm. always, struck, you know, pushed through them, you know, and I've made sacrifices. And my family have made sacrifices for me, but I've made sacrifices which I've been so focused where people have been saying to me, well, why don't you just do this job? Like you're being offered it and it's paying you this money. And, uh, and I'd be like, that's not where I want to go in my acting career. I know where I want to go. And so I'd rather sleep on people's sofas and floors and sell my car and do all these things to not do that job because I know it's not in my long-term plan of where I need to go as an actor and an artist. Mm. And so I made many, many sacrifices in my career. And I think my dad was witness to that. And, and he was supportive of that all the way. And, you know, the times I would go to him and borrow a few quid just to be able to get on a train so I could get to an audition. And, uh, and so, yeah, so he, that was a really special and magical moment telling him that. Um, because no matter who you are, you sort of understand the importance of BAFTA. <laughs> and I think he understood yeah. the importance of that. And I just said, this is what it means. And uh, he broke down in tears and it was really special, really, really special. Wow. And um, yeah, that helped me. That helped me and that helped open doors that were mm -hmm. firmly closed or doors that I couldn't open. And then suddenly, I mean, I'm still the same actor. I'm still the same artist. I'm still the same person but we know how the world works and we know how these industries work. And suddenly having that seal of approval enabled me to open certain doors and I fully credit it with taking my career to the next level. What has been your attitude to fame, Ray? You're around a lot of famous people in the various projects you do. And I suppose they have a certain relationship with fame and have come to peace with the whole issue of fame or don't handle it well, as many people in the spotlight don't. Have you decided early on that this is how it will be in terms of any exposure I have, any level of fame I attain to? What should become your relationship and attitude towards fame in the industry? Very different to what it was in the early days. I guess I'm fortunate enough to have been acting from a young age and mm. to have had roles that were significant enough to offer attention and uh i think probably what it was thinking back to when i was in my early 20s uh, there was there is an uh, uh an attraction to it i guess and it was but my attitude changed changed pretty early on pretty early on of achieving 
recognition. Um, not so much for what I was doing as an actor, but for being on television and for being in people's homes X amount of times a week. I realized early on that it's not as enjoyable. I'm far too paranoid of a person mm. and shy and awkward of a person mm. to be fully comfortable with it. Um, and I'm glad, I'm glad I realized it early on. I'm glad mm. that it wasn't all the bells and whistles that everyone expects it to be. And I had the realization of that. Of course, some people um, aim for a career in my industry to for that sole purpose mm. of just becoming famous for me it it i know it's a a knock on effect of successful work and i and i don't think i'll ever be at peace with it i'm quite a private person and so i don't think i and 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 i said as i say shy and awkward so I've, i'll never be fully comfortable with it but my attitude has changed because I know that with fame, if we want to call it that, or success, which I'd rather call it, but with that become, comes a voice. And if it gives me a voice, then I will have to, I will deal with my uncomfort mm. with it mm. to have that voice. And, mm. uh, yeah, it's interesting because it was only again in the last few years where I realized, you know, I've just been driven and ambitious and I know where I've wanted to head as, as an actor and artist. However, as I've gone through my own spiritual journey in the last few years, I've worked out that it was never about winning the Oscar or achieving recognition. It was never been about that. I thought it was about that. And it was never about that. It was always about me being given a platform to change people's views on things or change the world in a certain way through my art. And, uh, and that's what it's become about. And whether it's only through my art or whether my art just gives me the platform to give me the voice to change the world in other ways, I hate saying change the world, change the world, but that's the way it feels since I've worked, gone on my spiritual journey. It feels like there's a significant calling in, in what I'm supposed to do with my life. And, uh, and I've, I'm not very good at articulating myself, but it's, this is merely mm. the, the acting, the filmmaking, the storytelling, is merely the uh, catalyst mm. for what I have to achieve. And so in answer to your question, I feel like the fame, the success, the career gives me a voice. And it's that voice is my ultimate calling and what I've got to use it for is more important. As, as a person of color, we are having this a chat Ray a couple of weeks after um, you know George Floyd's death and all this stuff kicking off around the world are you hopeful about this whole thing in the world are you optimistic generally about where this is heading in society I've been optimistic so many times yeah and have felt let down yeah so does it feel different this time? Yes. Mm. Am I sure it will bring about change? I don't know is the honest answer. I mm. don't know. But I'm sure going to stand by and, and support the cause. Absolutely. Because, I, I don't know, it's been very upsetting for me these last couple of weeks to to witness what's been going on. And... Uh, and actually to try and fully understand the pain of what my black friends have gone through. Mm. And uh, it's been truly eye-opening because I thought I understood the pain. I didn't. Mm. And um, hopefully by the time this interview comes out, there will be have been some 
significant changes to the world. Mm. Um, hopeful that I've been let down before. Let's just yeah. Ask. Yeah. Let me ask you last few minutes. Just want to ask you about yourself, how you look after yourself in all that you've got on all the tension that you have and everything you're doing. Obviously lockdown has made us all a bit more stationary, a bit more still opportunity to be more still inside are more thoughtful about personal development, about growing ourselves. What do you do or what new things have you begun to do during the lockdown in terms of um, being healthy internally? I guess trying to, I mean, I haven't because generally I've been unhealthier during this lockdown. Um, <laughs> thinking too much, eating yeah. too much. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I, uh, I try and take some time out I, I i have gone for longer walks and and uh meditated on those walks and you know just try to because my brain does go to crazy wild places i guess that again it's having that storyteller's brain you sometimes can't shut it up and uh yeah, yeah. <laughs> you make you make up stories in your own head uh -huh. um uh, uh but yeah, so I've, I've, um, I've, uh, been trying to quiet, quieten myself, taking these long walks, putting in the ear pods and just, uh, meditating, focusing, uh, trying to stay spiritual and, and focused on that side of things. And, uh, yeah, I guess that's, I mean, there's been some huge trials and tribulations during this time, sort of mm -hmm. mentally for me. Mm -hmm. Um, but I, I take those moments out and I've learned to, I think before I used to cover up dealing with those moments by just working very, very hard. Mm -hmm. So just silence my mind by working hard, 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 hard. And I think what shifted in me in the last few years, which again is all part of the whole journey is um, I've learned to sit in those moments, to be quiet, to allow those thoughts to come in. Um, and to deal with them. And it's been, I guess there's no coincidence that things have progressed in my career. That glass ceiling is finally breaking down um, because I think it's aligned with my spiritual health. Mm -hmm. Ray, how can the people listening find you? What, what will we see you in next? What projects have you got coming out? What are you working on, et cetera? Uh, Acting wise, um, we've got season three of Marcella, which uh, is out yeah. soon um, on Netflix. And then for UK audiences, it will be out in the autumn. Then um, I've got this uh, Netflix project called Away, which is an exciting project. And that will be out in September, I believe. Um, a couple of films coming out, a, a brilliant film called Boiling Point with Stephen Graham. Uh, that will be out uh, probably early next year sometime. And uh, just uh, focusing on lots of um, my, I've taken it, I'm taking a bit of time out now to just focus on uh, my own projects that I'm developing and uh, projects that I'll be directing. So yeah. Very Talking cool. Writing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Well, listen, I want to say a massive thank you to you for your time. I think you're a genius and a great human, uh, even more so. And it's been a joy to know you. I remember you coming to my masterclass in London, and we've had a good relationship afloat ever since then. And uh, I've really come to appreciate the craft of what you do and what your industry is through knowing you more than I ever did before. I want to thank you for your time that you've given to you, me Paul. and our listeners around this whole issue of your career and what you do and putting us into your shoes for a few minutes today. Thank you, my friend. I wish you well. We'll keep in touch. Thanks, Paul. Well, thanks again for listening to today's podcast. I hope you found it beneficial. And uh, I know time is precious commodity for us all, but I would love it if you would take the time to write a review or comment. And above all, maybe subscribe to my podcast channel. Thank you.